Uh, good afternoon all the uh, the session will start in next uh, few minutes uh, we are waiting for the other participants to join as well the session will start sharp at uh, 335 Session will be starting in another two minutes. We are uh, waiting for the other participants to join. I request everyone's patience here.
So uh, good afternoon all. On uh, behalf of e-commerce, it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome you all. I'm your host and uh, we have our speaker, Ms. Uh, Preeti Mahesh, Chief Program Officer, Toxic Links. Thank you for taking the time to join us today as we talk about the environmental regulations for e-waste in India. And to make sure we are helping you as best as we can on uh, environmental regulations for e-waste in India, we have a Q&A box to source your questions. Feel free to drop uh, drop on the top, drop the questions on the topic or uh, share your struggles and experiences. We'll answer your questions by the end of the session. If you have any concerns about the audio or video clarity, please do comment on the chat box. Only the questions which come in under uh, the Q&A box will be answered. Uh, please post all the questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. And uh, before starting the webinar, I'd like to give some insights about our upcoming Globe's biggest exhibition and conference for recycling the third edition of e-commerce expo after su successful completion of two editions with participation from leaders across the globe this year we have we are bringing it even more larger in scale it's a three day exhibition and conference focused on three different streams e-waste recycling and refurbishment battery waste recycling and refurbishment automotive uh, recycling and refurbishment with around 70 plus stalls 50 plus renowned uh, speakers 600 plus delegates and 5,000 plus visitors scheduled on 18th, 19th and 20th May at the Lalit Ashok Bangalore. It is a gateway to all reverse commerce businesses in India. This event is supported by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Karnataka State Pollution Control Board, Bureau of Indian Standards, Digital India. This event will give a stage to trade, debate and discuss about uh, refurbishment and repair asset management, best in collection procedures, effective implementation of EPR, latest recycling technologies, material recovery solutions, end of life strategies, regulatory and business models, and shout out the way ahead for each of the sector. Further built in uh, best practices for recycling and refurbishing in the most effective way and pave the way towards sustainability and a circular economy. So here we go with a video of the e-commerce expo. Globe's biggest recycling expo conference and exhibition. Experience. A comprehensive collaboration, ready to inspire minds with latest technologies. We have come a long way to get to where we are today. A gateway to all reverse commerce businesses in India. What drives us forward? Innovation that can power a greener nature together. Discover the unknowns about a sustainable circular economy. Recommerce Expo has brought the individuals together with the support of Government of India to discuss a healthier, happier, and more sustainable tomorrow. We have been connecting people around the globe. Exchanging ideas, latest technologies, and bringing in a new culture to explore the unknowns. We welcome you to experience the inexperienced. So I request everyone to cash in on the opportunity to meet like-minded dignitaries and network with the C-suite executives and star walls from the industry. Registrations are already open and uh, seats are getting filled. Uh, interested participants can reach us using the contact details, which I'll be sharing in the chat box quickly. And uh, for more information, you can visit our website. And for more updates, you can also follow our LinkedIn page and our Telegram group. We need your feedback so that we get uh, better at our uh, deliverables. And thank you for your time. And so without further delay, let me introduce Ms. Preeti Mahesh, who will be sharing her impeccable knowledge on environmental regulations for e-waste in India. Uh, Ms. Preeti is an environmentalist and has been involved in various environmental issues for almost two decades. She is currently working as a chief program coordinator at Toxic Links, a nonprofit organization in, uh, based in India, and has been responsible for conceptualizing 
and uh, putting into action many environmental activities initiatives campaigns especially on waste and chemical issues as a strong advocate of minimalism ms preeti is currently focusing on reduction and repurposing of waste and bringing in repair culture so ms preeti welcome on board and the stage is yours thank you um thank you chelsa and uh, thank you to recommerce for uh, providing this uh, platform to reach out to so many people um as you said i've been working in the field of environment for a um, couple of decades now and um, you know um, the whole aim has been how to improve uh, environment um, but also you know kind of uh, try and see how we can um, uh, bring in sustainable systems and not really you know kind of uh, talking about um stopping everything uh, to save to save environment but in the current situation how do we um, you know find solutions which are sustainable and which are feasible i think that's uh, something which has been um, uh, on my agenda uh, for the last two decades and that's the case when we are talking about e waste as well um that we know that um, you know um electronics are going nowhere they have been become a part and parcel of our lives and um, especially i think um, the pandemic uh, has also clearly you know kind of shown uh, the advantages or the pros of using electronics um in spite of all the pandemic we were connected so i think um, it has a lot of benefits so it's not obviously something which we can eliminate from life um so we need to see how we and how when where this opportunity to make it um, a sustainable consumption and not really something which ends up um, polluting the environment and also ends up uh, impacting the health of um, people um so that uh, that was um, you know something with where we i started working on this with this um, in mind in 2004 or 5 on e-waste and it's been a long journey on um, you know trying to get a regulatory framework which finally came in in 2011 became applicable from 2012 uh men india had e waste um, you know rules uh, which were um, uh, you know uh, put into force which was in 2012 for the first time and um, since then there has been a revision in 2016 um which where the new regulation came in and um, you know kind of i will be talking about uh, the details of that regulation and how does it you know kind of impact um, each uh, stakeholder as such um what are the roles and responsibility of each of the stakeholders and um you know though you can probably read the rules um there are obviously interpretations of that and i'll be happy to you know kind of um also at the end of um this uh, uh presentation i'll be happy to answer any questions that you have um, where you want to kind of uh, uh you know kind of uh, to clear your doubts so if you have any questions uh, please feel free um at the end of it i'll try and answer as many um yeah till so just confirm if you're able to see my screen yes ma'am the screen is visible yeah so yeah so as i said that you know the e waste regulation which came in in 2016 that's the last version which is currently you know in force um, and valid um this is basically um you know the focus is uh, also to enable the recovery or reuse of useful material from waste because um you know in the last i would say you know half a decade or more we are also getting into a framework where we're talking about um you know natural resource depletion um you know a lot of critical metals which we are um, you know uh, which, which there are already you know reports which clearly say that these materials or these critical metals um will become um out of stock or we will run out of these materials and so one of the focus areas when the rules were um, you know kind of notified was to enable the recovery and reuse of um useful uh, material from um electronics and um this would not just you know kind of um uh, i would say promote circular economic concept but also reduce the amount of toxic waste which would um, you know end up in the environment or which needs to be managed so that there, there is obviously a dual purpose in that and um, as i said uh, this was in 2016 came into force on 1st of october um this um, the the 
rules basically apply to a lot of stakeholders who are engaged in it. It's from you know people who manufacture electronics to you know the producers, um, individual consumers um, like you and me, and also bulk com consumers as organizations, offices, uh, companies, um, to collection centers, dealers. Um, e-retailers. So this was a new thing which came in in 2016, which was not there in the prior version. Um, so this is e-retailers who sell it online are also part of this now. Uh, refurbishers, dismantlers, and recycling. Basically, the whole chain of it in terms of sale to you know purchase, collection, storage, everything has been you know tried to be covered um, through this. And um, mainly, if you look at it, is covering um, which is listed under Schedule One is certain amount of equipments uh, when we are talking about e-waste uh, there are different kinds of definitions globally so there are definitions in eu if you go there are 10 categories of electronics which have been listed so it includes anything which is running by electricity more, more or less it's get gotten covered under the regulation but when we speak about india in 2012 there were two categories where we're looking at one was it equipments and the second was it in telecom and the second was some um, you know uh, white goods or uh, you know household electronics so those were the only two categories which were listed in 2012 and that has been expanded slightly in 2016 um, but it is a I would say it's a far cry from what you see in Europe and or many other countries where a huge amounts like medical equipments or toys or your small equipments at home, like a you know kind of electric shaver or a hair dryer or a mixie, all that gets covered um, in EU, uh, which is not the case in India. So this this regulation is only you know um, uh, applicable to producers, manufacturers, consumers of certain kinds of food, a certain category which has been listed out. Um, Three uh, exceptions which have been made in the regulation is that it's not applicable to use lead acid battery uh, because the batteries are covered under another regulation and um, uh, it's, it does not apply to micro enterprises uh, which are covered under the micro, small and medium enterprises. So if you're doing any manufacturing in a micro or a small uh, uh, in a micro enterprise, um, then you do not get covered. Uh, so that's one exception uh, which has been made in the regulation and obviously the radioactive waste is also not part of it, it kind of falls under um, the next category, uh, it's another category. Um, so this is the schedule that I was talking about, the kind of goods that are covered uh, in under Indian regulation. So first section is the IT, um, information technology and the telecommunication equipment. So if you see there is, you know, list of what all gets covered. So there's a data processing mainframes, there's personal computers, there are laptops, there are notebooks. Um, so these were again new, um, new additions, as I would say, notebooks, notepads, these were not covered in the first portion of the regulation. Um, then comes printers, um, photocopy machines, uh, typewriters, user terminals, and fax machines. So this is basically comprises your, um, you know, in IT and telecom equipments. And if you see on the right side, um, you have particular codes which have been assigned to these, um, uh, each of these equipments. And that's, uh, that, that is a very important thing as well, um, which, which uh, will come into force and, um, you know, which I will explain once we get into the more details. Um, the next category, um, there are some more in the first category itself, which um, there are all kinds of telecom equipments as well. So there is telephone, there is, um, you know, kind of even your landline telephones, um, your pay booth, which are hardly there now, but um, they have been covered. Um, your cordless phones, your cellular phones, answering system, all of this gets covered under the first category with, um, you know, different triple E code. And the second category, um, the category almost remains same, which is the consumer electronics and electrical. So basically looking at, um, you know, kind of large household equipment. Um, so there are four things only covered under that, television, refrigerator, washing machine, and air condition. And one additional thing which has been added and which was a much in demand category and which um, was included in 16, which was not there again in 12, is the fluorescent or mercury containing lab. So this was, this was a, a demand of a lot of stakeholders for many years that mercury-containing lamps should be included because mercury is 
uh, one of the most toxic metals known to mankind um, and it has um, huge uh, you know uh, development and nervous system impacts and that's the reason why uh, it was uh, very essential that it gets included in electronic waste regulation and that uh, was done in 2016. So the, these are the category of electronics uh, which are come under, under the regulation. So anything apart from that, this rule will not apply as I said. So if you're using a mixer grinder or an oven or a microwave, these things will not get covered. If you're in office as well, if you're using other equipments which are not mentioned here, it doesn't get covered. So, um, so that's, uh, as I said, there, there is a limited number of um, you know, equipment which has been listed. This has been also, uh, I think there have been already discussions about expanding this list. There might be other things which will get included in this slowly. Uh, but yes, currently this is where we stand. So there are, I think it's also important to understand some of the definitions which have been put under the regulation. Um, so end of life means the time in the products is intended to be discarded by the user. So that's how end of life is dis uh, uh, defined. And e-waste is anything which is, you know, a whole or in part discarded. So even if you're discarding, for example, um, you know, kind of battery from your uh, mobile phone, um, or you are discarding, you know, kind of a cartridge from printer, it becomes an electronic because it's, it, it is whole or in part of that electronics that you're using. So if you reject it, um, and this not just covers a post-consumer waste, so it's not just about you know, after usage, but it's also looking at manufacturing, refurbishing, repair processes. So anything, any part which comes out, for example, during refurbishment or a repair. So if there's a, for example, if phones are being refurbished and there is you know casings changed on that um, uh, to give it a new look. Um, so even the casing that would fall under electronic uh, waste. Um, so yes, all um, repair process, even if a small battery is changed in that, that gets covered under electronics if those goods are covered under the schedule one. Um, so that's where uh, the cash line is. So, I mean, for example, your table fan or a ceiling fan, uh, since it's not covered, it won't, uh, any part of it, if you change it or anything, it doesn't get covered. Um, then there is an important definition one which needs to realize is historical e-waste. So anything which is you know, listed in this schedule, so this is under these categories, but this was sold before or it was generated before the rules came in. So if it was done before 2016, um, then it would come in historical waste. And also an important definition is an orphan waste that um, you know if there is, for example, a brand, uh, which was in existing but closed down, closes down its operation or you know shuts business or is no longer doing business in India. Uh, what happens to that waste? Because that producer is not here, that that brand is not existing here. Who takes care of that? So that has been defined as orphan waste, and there's been responsibility assigned in that as well. Um, so yeah. Um, now, uh, the other important definition is of the producer, obviously. So producers, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, kind of, I would say, cover a lot of, um, you know, kind of uh, um, subcategories where we're looking at uh, people who are not just, you know, producers um, typically would mean that, you know, somebody who's producing the goods, but it's not here that even if uh, the person, you know, um, irrespective of how he sells it, so whether it's an online sale or it's, you know, kind of somebody who is importing goods but selling it in his, um, uh, its own brand name. Um, so any all of people who are assembling goods and selling it, so all of these um, are defined under producers. So even if you are not manufacturing, for example, or it's not your own, um, you know, good, but you are importing it and selling it under your own brand, then it becomes... Uh, you become a producer and you are liable to follow this regulation and the stipulations under it. Um, then there is another, as I said, this was a new definition which came in, which is e-retailers, which is um, basically entities which are selling, um, you know, kind of online. Um, so any electronic network that people are using through internet or phone, uh, people who are selling it, they, are, they come under e-retailer. 
And another category we're looking uh, definition, which came in again in 2016, which is the PRO concept, which is the producer responsibility organization, um, which is uh, basically a concept which has been borrowed from Europe again, where you know um, this is a, this could be a professional organization, this could be a not-for-profit organization, um, but this is basically a, a company or a or an entity which fulfills the responsibility of the producers. So producers, in, um, you know, producers have certain responsibility, and they uh, use a third agency or an external agency to uh, basically fulfill their own responsibility. So um, that's where the producer responsibility organization comes into play. And this could be somebody who's uh, doing it for one brand or maybe somebody who's doing it for five brands. So there could be one uh, PRO who is uh, uh, managing uh, produce uh, the, the responsibilities assigned uh, to four producers, for example, and that may include for example, I'm just giving an example. Somebody who's taking care of Samsung as well, somebody who's taking care of Apple as well, or HP. So there could be one agency um, uh, doing collection or setting systems for all these four brands. Or it could be just one-to-one -one that, you know, you're just doing it for one company like a Goodrich or one company like Apple. Um, so producer responsibility is again a new concept which has been defined under the new regulation. Um, we go on to the next one, which is again important, which is manufacturer. Um, it's basically an entity which would be registered in the normal you know, kind of companies act and factory, and uh, it's basically uh, manufacturing triple E. So this is not just people who are selling it, uh, but manufacturing it. So in some cases, a manufacturer could be a producer as well. Um, uh, and in some cases, uh, some brands obviously may not be doing any manufacturing, they may be just importing it and selling it. So um, that's how it's been defined. Uh, dismantle is somebody who's kind of um, engaged in dismantling or you know, kind of opening up of um, the different components um, and has authorization with the State Pollution Control Board. Um, I think refurbisher is uh, pretty clear in definition that um, who's engaged in refurbishing and recycle is somebody who's doing material recovery. So that's also been clearly you know, kind of demarketed that uh, all people who are processing e-waste are not necessarily dismantlers or recyclers. There's a clear definition. Dismantler is somebody who's kind of uh, opening up or dismantling it, and recycler is somebody who's engaged in, um, you know, kind of uh, a recovery of material as such, and obviously they need to be also authorized under the regulation. Now, two more definitions that I would focus on is bulk consumer and consumer. They've been defined separately because they are different uh, responsibility which has been uh, assigned to them. Um, um, so all of us who are using electronics become uh, consumers. Um, so we uh, basically all of us are consumers, but there is a subset which is like a bulk consumer who are uh, you know any large users of uh, these equipments which have been listed in Schedule One. Um, so it could be government departments, it could be public sector, it could be private offices, it could be international agencies, schools, colleges. Um, so all of these, um, you know, kind of uh, who are uh, 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 listed, uh, registered under Factories Act or Companies Act, um, or, you know, even the hospitals get covered under this. So anything which is also uh, looking at, um, you know, turn of over of more than one crore or more than 20 employees. So either of this uh, entire uh, makes you a bulk consumer. So if you have a small office with five employees and a turnover less than a crore, then you, you, you become consumer and not a bulk consumer. So that how, that's how it's been demarcated. Uh, the biggest concept which has come in uh, in electronic waste regulation is the EPR concept of the extended producer responsibility, which was there in 2012 as well, and which has been you know, kind of retained in 2016. Um, this is obviously the, the most, um, I think, widely used uh, principle across the globe for managing of e-waste and increasingly for all waste uh, streams. So it's basically um, a responsibility where the brands or the companies who put product in the market are not just responsible for, you know, kind of uh, putting the product in the market and the, the time during that or the service, because a lot of time when companies sell products, they kind of, um, for example, give you a warranty or guarantee. So that means they are responsible for that uh, 
product during that phase as well. Um, but then this regulation extends that further than that. So um, extends further than that repair or guarantee period um, uh, and uh, make sure that they have uh, taking responsibility of taking back uh, e-waste after the, the consumer or bulk consumer has decided to discard it. Um, so, so under the EPR, there have been certain you know, kind of mandates which have been clearly listed out and uh, uh, they can do it together. Uh, the producers can come together and uh, fulfill their responsibility or they can do it individually as well. So that's uh, you know, kind of uh, the mandate under the regulation as well. Um, then when we're looking at the EPR plan, um, so all brands, if you're looking at the producers specifically, uh, because the extended producer uh, uh, responsibility is applicable to producers only. Um, so the brands which are selling the products in the market or which are putting the products in the market, um, uh, all of them have to seek authorization. And the process of authorization includes that you have to to um, give an EPR plan. So you have to provide a plan to the Central Pollution Control Board uh, when you apply for the authorization in which you have to detail out as to how you are going to collect the electronic waste that you're mandated to collect. Um, uh, if you are using any of PRO, which is the Producer Responsibility Organization, or you are using any other means um, to collect this ELP waste, then you have to clearly mention that in the plan and submit it. It, um, it could be an annual plan. So every year you have to submit as to. Uh, well, usually I think you can put in longer period plan as well, unless there's a change. So if there's any change in between, then you have to um, you know, resubmit this. So basically authorization is a permission that you get from CPCB for produ uh, uh, under the EPR uh, authorization, you basically a permission for the brands to uh, manage their program according to the plan that they have submitted. Um, then there was an interesting co concept which um, was introduced again in the 2016 regulation and which is not um, uh, mandatory. It's been given as an optional, um, you know, kind of scheme which uh, the brands or the producers could use, which is DRS scheme. Um, I, I think I would, ex um, it is uh, uh, basically that producers charges a sum at the time of sale, which, uh, which, is, uh, which can be utilized um, at the end of it uh, to manage it, manage the waste generated from that. If anybody has uh, more queries, I could explain it later. Um, then. Um, uh, another, I think, uh, or I would say the one of the most important changes, apart from including the lighting in this 2016 version, I think this is the most important change, which was there in 2016 rule, and that's on the tab. So it's basically the 2012 rules also had, uh, um, you know, EPR, as I said, this was a concept introduced in 12, and which also made brands, um, you know, um, mandated to collect back electronic waste. Um, but unfortunately, nothing was happening on that account. Um, nobody was collecting it back. They put some kind of infrastructure, but there was nothing coming in. And um, the brands were not making any effort or the producers were not making enough efforts to collect e-waste back. And that's where this whole concept of target came in, uh, wherein the, the government has uh, clearly mentioned as to how much you have to collect. So if you have sold you know, X number, uh, there is a certain percentage, which I will, you know, kind of again share later as to what, how is this percentage calculated that you get, take back that much, um, back, uh, you know, kind of uh, e-waste you have to collect back. So there is a target that you have to achieve at the end of every year, um, uh, every financial year. So it's not an open-ended that, you know, if you sold 100, for example, 100 uh, mobile phones, and if you collect one, it is fine. It is not. There is a target which has been given to you, so you have to collect accordingly. And if you don't meet the target, uh, you could be penalized. So if you look at, uh, you know, the biggest role in waste is on the producers. Um, and um, that's the EPR concept which is uh, coming in. And uh, if you look at what all it, it entails, basically, uh, their responsibility, uh, since they are the main stakeholders in this, 
um, is collection and channelization of e-waste uh, generated from end of life products with the same triple E code and historical waste. So um, this is the important key that, uh, you know, it's not that if you're selling computers, you can take back mobile phones. No, you can't. Um, you, if you are selling television, that means you have to, your target is related to television. If you've sold 100 television, you have to collect back 30. So you can't collect 30 mobile phones or 30 refrigerators or a mix of 10 refrigerator, 10 mobile phones, you cannot. You have to collect the same category of triple E. So we're not going by only weight. We are going by weight, but we're not going, uh, you know, kind of... Um, harmonized waste of different categories. So even if you're a brand which is selling 10 kind of products, uh, for example, if we take some company like uh, Samsung, which is selling probably refrigerators as well, and I think uh, televisions as well, uh, air conditions as well, I think Samsung uh, or LG sell a lot of these equipment. So your targets for each of those categories are different. So you have to meet each equipment, um, you know, by category, uh, the target assigned to you. So you cannot have if your target for uh, TV is 10 kg and your refrigerator target is 30 kg, you cannot, um, you know, take 15 of television and 15, 40 of uh, refrigerator. You cannot. You have to you target for each category is different and it has to be treated separately. And then also you have the responsibility of collecting the historical waste. That means the waste which was uh, there before there's this regulation coming, any waste generated from that, that also you have to collect it. Um, then you have to, I already said that you have to uh, seek authorization from Central Pollution Control Board with a detailed plan of how you uh, want to get uh, take back this. Um, then uh, you have to ensure that there's end-to-end -end recycling. So your job does not end in just collecting and giving it to the recycler. You have to ensure that it's recycled in the proper manner with a proper trail of you know how much material is coming in how much is going out um, so you have to ensure basically uh, the whole chain um, then you have to file and returns as to how much you collected how did you collect where did it go if you collected 10 kgs well with this 10 kgs sent to um, so that all you have to send details you have to maintain these records and you have to also file returns um, Creating awareness. This is again a key bit that your role does not just end in collecting back. So you could just not go to the market and you know buy e-waste and you know fulfill your target, but you have to create awareness through media, publications, advertisements, um, posters. So you have to, when you report on your annual um, you know, annual returns or when you make an EPR plan, you have to specify all of these details um, and provide it to the CPC, provide to CPC. Uh, there's a process for authorization as well, which is basically, as I said, um, there's an EPR plan and it should contain of these details, um, your general scheme. So whether you're doing it from the dealer or you're using a PRO or you, know, you, you set up your own collection centers. Um, so the kind of system, again, the DRS system, if you're using DRS, that, as I said, it's not a mandatory system. You are, uh, it's, it's an option which has been given. Um, under the regulation, but if you are using it, then you have to, you know, kind of uh, clearly mention that in your EPR uh, authorization plan. Um, then detail of the recycler. So the recycler with which you are going to um, be connected, where your e-waste will be um, given, it has to be an authorized recycler and you have to name the recycler. So you have to put the details of the recycler you tied up with. Um, you have to inform every time there's a change you have to plan. So if you're changing a recycler or you, you know, for example, you had a DRS scheme, but you're now going, you know, you're removing the DRS scheme. Um, you're working with PRO and now you change, want to change your PRO or you want to work directly yourself. Um, so any of those changes have to be reported to CPCB. Um, operation, uh, you know, operation without authorization is illegal and um, is considered to be causing damage to the environment. Um, and the import of tri uh, triple E is only allowed to producers who are having EPR authorization. So if you do not have EPR authorization, then you will not be able to bring any electronics uh, to sell it. So for example, earlier there was a point where there were a lot of um, you know, electronics which were coming in from China and there was no one responsible because the brands were not taking um, you know, ownership or those small brands were not really you know, setting up a system. So if you do not have a system or you do not really have an authorization, 
Um, you've not sought authorization, you are not allowed to sell your product in India. Um, this is the target which has been defined under the regulation. So the first two years of the implementation, the rule came in in 2000, but then, uh, 2016, but um, you know, since there was some confusion, uh, the targets came into force only, I think, in 2018, October or so. Um, uh, so that's when the, the whole target started, and um, that's 30% of the quantity of waste generated as per indicated in EPR plan. So you have to, uh, the brands or the producers have to mention that how much you know, waste will be generated from their goods, how much they have sold, and uh, accordingly, your waste is calculated. And uh, if you've, um, you know, kind of uh, sold 100 computers, and there is a lifespan which has been defined in the guideline. There is a CPCB guideline on this, um, and which defines the lifespan which has been calculated for each kind of good. So, for example, light, mercury bearing light, light may have two years of lifespan. I think a computer has a five-year lifespan, a television, I think around eight years. So each of these equipments have a lifespan which has been calculated on the basis of that. Uh, the quantity is gen, uh, you know, waste uh, target is calculated. So if you sold a computer today, for example, a hundred computer, and computer has a lifespan of five years, um, then uh, according to thirty percent target, five years from today, which is two thousand twenty-seven, you have to collect thirty computers back. So this is how it is uh, kind of calculated. And uh, for the third and fourth year, um, you know, the the percentage goes up to 40% the target and fifth and sixth 50 and seventh year onward with 70%. So it is progressively going higher the, the amount of electronic waste each brand or producer have to collect. Um, then there's the responsibility of producers, collection centers and refurbishers, which um, basically manufacturer has to make sure that um, any, any waste which is generated during the manufacturing process has to be handled properly, maintain the cards, apply for an authorization, um, um, yeah, um, so, and ensure that it uh, is recycled in a proper manner. Uh, collection center, which was a concept in 2012 as well, which was a standalone collection center in 2012, you could, you know, run a collection center standalone um, that you are collecting e-waste and then you give it to ABCD recycler, which are authorized, but that concept was ended in 2016. Now, you can only collect in behalf of one of these agencies which are authorized, which is producer, dismantler, recycler, refurbisher. So you could be a collection agent from one of these or a PRO, um, but you cannot be an independent uh, you know, kind of identity. You can't collect on your own uh, you know, name. Um, so that's a change which happened from 12 to 16. And obviously uh, the records are common for all of them. Refurbishing um, only needs one-time authorization from SPC. And uh, basically, they have to collect anything which is during refurbishment uh, and channelize it to the dismantlers. Um, there are clear responsibility for dismantlers and recyclers, which obviously means they have to take authorization, all permissions, um, according to the standards and guidelines, uh, which are updated by CPCB. Um, and then um, they have to also obviously follow um, other norms uh, under the hazardous waste as well. Um, for dismantlers, they have to make sure that this waste which they dismantle is sent to an authorized recycling if they do not have a recycling license. So if you are only authorized to be a dismantler, you cannot do any recycling. You have to ensure that you give it to a recycling facility for the material recovery. And the non-recyclable, so there are, um, you know, there might be certain parts of your uh, dismantled wood which, which is which is uh, not bought by the recycler because he's not interested, for example, in that particular component for recycling as there is no value. So you have to make sure that those parts, um, you know, uh, are properly managed and sent to uh, uh, TSDF facilities, which is uh, treatment storage disposal facilities uh, notified under the hazardous waste rules. Um, uh, for the recyclers, obviously, um, you know, uh, again, uh, there's a mandate that they have to uh, send all residues or something which is not recycled um, to the TSDF. But also, if, for example, if you are an e-waste recycler, but you may not have an integrated plan, plan, uh, plant and you may not be recycling plastic, which comes out of electronics, or you may not be recycling the aluminum which comes out um, from certain components of uh, electronics. 
So if you have to send it to an authorized recycler, you cannot really just give it out um, to unauthorized recyclers in the informal sector or so. So you have to make sure all your material which comes out from your uh, e-waste recycling as well um, are given to proper authorized recyclers. Um, they may accept uh, uh, EEE, which is not listed under this. Um, uh, they, they are the only agencies which are allowed to take in EEE, which is not in the Schedule 1, um, but they have to make sure that there's no radioactive material or, you know, kind of, um, and also they have to, uh, you know, uh, mention that when they're taking authorization, that I'll be also, for example, treating a uh, microwave or an oven or any other good that they want to. Um, so if you look at the bulk consumer responsibility, which are the offices or the factories or the, you know, uh, the large users, um, they must deposit their e-waste through producers' e-waste take-back system program or give it to register, dismantle register. So these are only two routes which have been uh, clearly mentioned, that either you give it to the brands where from where you bought it, um, um, or any of the brands. So one thing is um, you know, pretty fluid in the regulation is that it's not as if when, uh, when you're setting up a collection center and if I am uh, a brand that uh, if I have to, and, and I'm selling a computer uh, or I'm selling mobile phones, that when I take back mobile phones, it has to be of the same, of my brand itself. So I can take any brands available in the market. So I can take, for example, if I'm a Samsung, I can take Apple, or any other and fulfill my target. So that is open. Um, so as a bulk consumer, you have the possibility if the brand is accepting it, um, then you can give your phone to anybody, any of the brands, but you have to make sure that it goes back to the take back program run by the producers or give it to any of the dismantlers or registered recyclers. Uh, all bulk consumer have to also find annual records and maintain. So they, this is not known to a lot of people. Uh, bulk consumers are not doing. Uh, there are a lot of violations in this. Uh, and slowly there is um, you know, action being taken on this. Um, and they are also not allowed to import used electronic and electrical equipment unless they seek um, you know, special permissions for this. Uh, for, for I've not clearly mentioned here, but for a general uh, normal consumer, individual consumer, um, uh, the point one remains same that they have to deposit their EVs to producers um, uh, or the dismantler or recycler chain, um, but they do not have um, the limitation of or the added responsibility of uh, filing returns or maintaining any records or, uh, you know, import they can obviously bring in as an individual, there are no restrictions on that listed out. Um, so this is the process of uh, authorization for dismantlers or recycler that they have to have a consent then to establish and also, you know, kind of uh, consent to operate uh, with their certificate of registration, et cetera, and capacity. And then um, you have to have uh, evaluation by SPCB, which is one 20 days maximum time frame where, by which SPCB has to evaluate it. Um, basically, all the environmental norms they will evaluate your your um, you know uh, pollution equipments. Um, your facility is designed in a way which is according to CPCB guidelines. Uh, after that, you get an authorization which is valid for uh, five years. Um, yeah. um, there are also norms in storage that they, you know how you're supposed to storage and you how long are you allowed to storage. So they are clearly mandate. Uh, given. Um, so 180 days is the limit which um, you are given that you can't store more than that. So uh, even if you're a bulk consumer, if you have an office, you can't store electronics for more than 180 days. And it's, you're not um, you know, legally, uh, you're not allowed to store more than 180 days. Unless again, you saw, uh, see, uh, you know, get a, uh, get a extended uh, permission uh, which is also maximum, I think, one year or so, where you can, you know, or for some some reason that you have to share that you have, you can extend it. Um, so yeah, the next important clause, which is there in the regulation. So uh, you know what we've been talking about is mainly the end of life part of it, um, that how e waste needs to be managed. But there is another component which is their part uh, of the regulation, which is 
um, in 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 the other regulations globally in EU uh, European Union or other countries um, uh, like uh, China or Korea, um, these have been treated as separate regulation. One is on the end of life part, and the other is on the material. Here, both have been combined. Uh, so in India, the e-waste tool also talks about reduction of hazardous substances in electronics. So every producer has to ensure that they, these, you know, um, uh, five listed materials, um, they are only allowed to the maximum concentration, which has been listed out. So they have to ensure that their products or spare parts or you know, the components do not contain more than this. So there's lead, mercury, cadmium, chromium, um, and uh, some ruminated flame retardant like PBB and PBD. So these have been, you know, kind of um, a percentage has been defined. Um, so your material cannot have more than this. So this has, for example, led to a lot of change in, uh, you know, the soldering material, which is used in electronics. Earlier, it used to be mainly lead. Um, but that change has happened mainly because of this regulation that slowly it's moved to other kind of, um, you know, material for uh, uh, soldiering and not the lead, um, because that would have meant uh, more than, you know, 0.1%. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is obviously after the rules um, were declared that this, uh, uh, this uh, restriction will become valid and also um, you know, this is kind of a self, uh, self, um, I would say, uh, declaration. So you, uh, the companies have to give it um, uh, proper documentation that they have this many limits, but this could be checked by CPCB at any point. Um, uh, so they can, you know, suddenly do uh, random checks on which, you know, some brands and some products and the cost has to be borne by the producers. And any sale import not allowed for non compliant uh, basically products. Sorry. Yeah, there's some other provisions of accident reporting. There is a liability um, clause um, for improper handling. Um, there is financial penalties um, by SPCB uh, to some of these, um, you know, non-compliance issues. Um, also, one important bit is the role of um, uh, urban local bodies. So municipalities are supposed to collect the often products which I mentioned. Um, basically, the the products which where brands have shut shop or you know may have gone bankrupt or stopped operation. Um, so those products have to collect, uh, be collected by the ULBs or munis municipalities and ensure that um, it's sent to the dismantlers or the recyclers. Um, some other regulations which become valid or which become applicable to, to uh, e-waste is hazardous waste, which is looking at import and export restrictions. And also some of the norms uh, become applicable as TSDF is also included in this regulation, which is uh, under the hazardous waste. Um, some of the permissions also for dismantlers or recyclers come under hazardous waste since they're dealing with um, uh, some of the materials uh, which are fall under hazardous waste. So that's one category uh, of regulation which is applicable on um, some of the operations on e-waste. And there is industry standards on anything. So there are restrictions on hazardous substances um, the ROSH, which is applicable for certain goods um, under e-waste rule, but if there are other chemicals which are listed in other regulatory frameworks, then that may be also applicable um, to electronics. Yeah, so that's it as my presentation. I think uh, right now, I think we should be taking questions, if that's fine. Telsa, you know, can, should we be taking questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Already we have 12 questions in the Q&A section. You can just see, have a look. Okay. Um, the first question, as I see how many registered e-waste recyclers are there in India, um, I think that list is available in the, uh, in the CPCB website. But as far as I remember, though there are about 250 or 260 processors listed out of that, recyclers are, I think, Handful, so there might be 10 or 12 recyclers, um, which are basically um, looking at material recovery. Um, but those numbers go up quite, uh, you know, kind of every second. So, yeah, just check on the CPCB website, you will get the detail. But there are most facilities are dismantlers, 
earlier it was a clubbed clubbed category and that's why it was difficult um, to see how many recycles and dismantles but now they've been clearly um, you know kind of defined um, including fluorescent lamps and mercury lamps will increase the complication for recycler how and where can these reattempts and recycle um uh, amrish paranj bhai um yeah so interesting question yes there have been a lot of um you know to and fro on the lighting but um, it's one of the most hazardous electronic based um, basically and that could not be ignored um so yes at this point there are limited technology in terms of uh, what could happen to these lamps um, um so you know even recyclers get license according to the material they can handle so not all recyclers um are allowed to take back mercury lamps so only the ones which have permission which have the equipment to handle the lamps um, um get permission to take it or um so that's that's one tricky bit i am not too sure um i think maybe one recycler in the whole of country may have a permission to to recycle lamps one or two um most of them do not have and that's the whole bit also uh, the whole epr concept is that the brands have to ensure that there's a you know kind of ecosystem created so the brands or the producers or the lighting companies are meant to ensure that there is a recycler comes in whether they have to pay for it uh, because lamps are at times negative good unlike uh, you know um, computers or mobile phones where you can when you recycle you recover a lot of material in case of lamps you do not and that's the reason why the producers have to uh, set up a ecosystem to take it back and uh, get it recycled so i think there have been a lot of pressure being created on the lighting industry in fact uh, i'm i'm just currently you know uh, finished a study where we're looking at that and um, you know trying to create pressure on the brands uh, lighting companies to ensure that uh, there is some recycling uh, infrastructure which comes in um yes i hope i've answered that um then the next question is from mr rangaswami please share more information on battery waste um so battery waste is not covered under regulation uh, e waste regulation unless it's part of um, you know e waste as a component so if um, there, there is a battery in your uh, for example in a remote then it gets covered um but there is already a battery regulation battery waste regulation which covers lead acid battery and that's being um, you know expanded or there's a new regulation which is being worked upon by ministry of environment forest it was in a making um, you know pre pandemic and unfortunately um it was in fact uh, put on public platform for comments and then the pandemic hit and everything you know kind of went haywire and uh, the regulation got delayed um but as far as my knowledge goes they are all they are still working on the regulation um so which will which will exclusively uh, you know deal with battery waste which will include lead acid battery your button cell batteries your lithium ion batteries so there will be a separate regulation on that um uh, um yes so that's the the thing that it's not really covered as such uh, just as a battery waste it's not covered if it's part of e-waste it is um the next question again from um mr amrish glass recycling is still a negative business in india so it's is it not more painful now for recyclers that they will be now forced to collect these types of lamps yes as i said this is they are not forced recyclers are not forced unless recyclers are um, you know have have the license they have taken the license to recycle um, uh, lamps they are not uh, they are they are not really uh, compelled to take if they are you are a e waste recycler uh, you define which e waste you are recycling um, the 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 government does not uh, force you to recycle a b c d you can say that i will only recycle mobile phone i will only recycle uh, uh, te television so um no i don't think this is painful for the recyclers unless uh, you've taken a permission and you've taken uh, you know you've worked out your economics um, of how to recycle lamps um where can i get the ppt i think i believe uh, chelsa to answer that um partha ghosh does it also cover items of industrial electronics and automation equipment no this only covers the items listed in this even if it's used in industrial space if these are the the equipments which are uh, which are used it will 
Um, the other electronic equipments, automation equipments, which are used in industry, no, they are not covered. It's only the scheduled one, only the scheduled one. Uh, it's only television, mobile phones, uh, printers, um, lamps, refrigerator, washing machine, uh, air condition. Yeah, so yeah, those are the ones. Um, so I think I've answered part two's question. Uh, Shubham, there is um, there is a mandation by CPCB department to ensure that there are at least 21 collection centers in different states to cover pan India. How is, is this requirement fine for the producer who have started these sales operations recently or their businesses limited to certain states? Um, so, uh, so for, for the companies which are new companies, one, the target is much lower. I think it's 5% for the first few years. Uh, I think they, they, um, that's defined in the CPCB guideline. And also, if you're not selling your product in each state, then you're not meant to, uh, if you're selling it only in certain states, if your sales operation are only in those states, you are only meant to have collection centers in the. Otherwise, this um, you know CPCB is asking for uh, collection centers in different states because otherwise what would happen typically was that brands would set up uh, collection centers in only in Bangalore and uh, Delhi, Gurugaon and Mumbai and uh, you know four major cities and collect all their use based from there and the rest of country can dump anywhere. So I think that was the, the reason. You know, for example, if you go to uh, northeast part of the country, there were hardly any collection centers. Um, so what do they do? Where do they dump it? Um, you know, that's also electronic waste and that's also um, you know, ca causing, uh, obviously, those are, again, more in terms of economically sense, uh, environmentally sensitive errors. And where do they throw it? Are they going to be creating a landfill of electronics? So you have to collect. You're not uh, meant to have a huge, um, you know, dismantling facility or a recycling facility, but you have to have a collection center uh, by where the producers can, if you can sell it. For example, if you have a dealer who is selling it, then he might as well collect it. You have a sales point. You can have a collection point as well. It makes um, you know business sense to uh, sell there, then it should make business sense to collect. Um, but if you're not uh, selling it in that particular state, you're not. For example, you may be a local brand. You may be just having a product which you only sell in, for example, in West Bengal, or you just sell it in Tamil Nadu. Then you're not supposed to send collection center in 21 states. Uh, 21 states. Um, presently, what is the EPR requirement in terms of percentage of production by the manufacturer? I'm not really clear of this question. What is the percentage of production? What do you mean by that? I'm not really clear. So, you know, if it's possible, I, you know, at the end of it, uh, you can explain further, then I will be able to answer. EPR, um, you know, is not mandated for manufacturer. It's only mandated for producers. Um, so manufacturer has to collect everything which is generated during their manufacturing process and give it to a recycler. So that's different. How is EPR plan regulated? So CPCB is basically monitoring your EPR plan and um, you have to uh, file returns. So if you have not met your targets, if your collection center, for example, at some point CPCB, I'm a bit rushing because we're already late. Uh, it, because if you have submitted a plan um, and um, you know in the plan, you're supposed to also provide the list of collection centers that you have. Um, so CPCB, I remember just before the pandemic, um, also did a, um, a visit, um, you know, they just randomly decided to visit some collection center. And um, um, some of those were not functional. Um, in fact, we have done a lot of studies as part of my organization, we've done a lot of studies where the brands have said that my ABCD center collects e-waste. Um, and when we go to those centers, they say we do not collect any. So those collection centers were, uh, some of these were uh, you know, busted by CPCB. And uh, in fact, uh, the license to import electronic, new electronic products was stalled or was um, you know, suspended for some of those big brands. They, they were big brands, was suspended for a, a period unless they kind of um, rectified those uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, problems and uh, ensured or gave a revised plan as to how they are uh, ta targeting that. So it, it is a very important component. In DRS, what kind of extra amount can be charges? Is there a capping on the sale? There's no capping on the sale. Um, it's just a market uh, mechanism. And unfortunately, it has not been used because, uh, um, you know, it's like a Coca-Cola bottle, which used to happen uh, many years back that uh, you take a deposit. But if, you know, your cost of a product is ABCD and your competitor is not um, charging that extra amount or you are the only one who is charging, 
uh, then it becomes difficult because your pri the, your pricing goes up. And that's the reason since there's no harmonization between producers, I don't think uh, the LS scheme has been used by anybody. Um, so it's basically any amount you can, you can decide that you want to, um, this was basically um, uh, brought in to, to somewhere facilitate the whole process or trigger that the, the consumer actually come back to you and not sell it in the informal market. Um, so it could be something which is uh, higher than what you get in the informal sector. Um, so, for example, if I get 500 rupees for a phone back when I return back, then maybe the company can keep it at 600 so that that extra 100 bucks makes me come back to the brand. Uh, or it can be in any, any amount. But if it could be, you know, for example, if it's 2000 rupees, um, then I may not want to come at all. I mean, I would say 2000 rupees, why would I pay more the initial front unless all brands are charging? So I think there is a bit of trickiness in um, DRS and that's the reason. It's a it's a good scheme uh, if done well, but um, unfortunately, I don't think any of the brands are using the others. Um, who can be a PRO? What is the functions of a PRO? Uh, anybody, any business entity can be a PRO. Um, in fact, a lot of dismantlers and recyclers are also acting as PROs. There are some NGOs who are acting as a PROs, and there are some companies who are acting as a PRO. So basically, you are a service provider. So that's the function that you are. You know, on, you are fulfilling the responsibility of the producer, all their responsibility or the responsibility that they have assigned to you. So, for example, if I am an HP and I say that, um, you know, uh, in, in five states in the country, you manage my collection. This is your target for five. So you are, you know, basically collecting on my behalf or you may be doing awareness on my behalf. Um, so that's the role of the uh, PRO um, in Europe also it's it's much um, you know since the concept has been around for two, since 2003 it's a little evolved and you know they take on responsibility of everything so basically they um, they ensure that um, you know uh, they they fulfill all your government uh, reporting uh, requirements uh, related to e-waste they collect on your behalf they ensure that it's gone to a recycler properly um, that whole chain they manage. So in in some of these countries, it's much evolved. In India, it's it's still evolving. But right now, most brands are using PRO for collection. So they will tell you that you know I need hundred tons of e waste from these five states. So you basically as a PRO uh, collect that and uh, supply it to the producer or give it to the recycler that the, the brand has uh, tied up with. So that's the function. Now, how is the target decided by company? The target is decided based on your sales. So you have to basically say how much uh, material have you put on the market and um, uh, going by the, the lifespan, which has been listed in the guideline. As I said, it's been listed for each of these material, which is uh, in schedule one, uh, lifespan of it. So it's two year, five year, eight year. So every product has a lifespan. And based on that, your collective, uh, your target is basically uh, calculated. Is PRO authorized to collect e-waste from, but yes, they are uh, authorized to collect from all kinds of consumers. Uh, yeah, bulk consumers, local consumers. They are, I think, uh, taking it from the informal sector as well, so yeah. But basically bulk consumer, local consumer, yes. Uh, what business revenue streams are there for PRO? Basically, the brands are paying you to collect waste for. So every kg that you collect and give it to the brand, they, you will get paid for it. Um, so uh, there are different models. So some brands may give you full targets and you know give you uh, a lump sum. They, some may give, most in India, as far as I know, give it to you per kg, so per ton or whatever um, you know by weight. That uh, if you collect that much tonnage of electronic waste on their behalf, you get paid by that. Um, there might be extra amounts that you pay for awareness or you know fulfilling responsibility, but those are business revenue streams basically. Uh, you know, your e-waste collection, any responsibility that you are paying that you get money from the brands. Brands are paying you basically. What could be the new change or amendments to the e-waste rule? Um, the the for, first and foremost change that I, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I'm see, I, I mean, I see in future is uh, the expansion of the list of e-waste. So I think there will be, uh, there should be a, a change in that, that uh, new goods or new equipments um, may be added to this. Um, to expand that list. So 
that is the first change I, 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 I kind of uh, um, perceive. Um, that was Sharika. Then we have Padam. Can we import e-waste? Uh, no, you cannot. Uh, that's banned under Basel Convention, which is the international transboundary uh, movement of uh, hazardous waste. Um, so e-waste is included in that, and India is a signatory to that convention, and we're not allowed to. Uh, it's a restrictive. We have not signed Basel ban. We have kind of signed the Basel Convention under which it's restricted. Uh, so you have to seek permission from uh, Ministry of Environment and Forest if you want to import. Um, but permissions are not being granted because um, I don't think uh, English can should be imported. I mean, I don't think. I think the country also at this point doesn't think that English should be imported. So I think permissions are not being granted. Are brands also responsible for brand owners only are responsible for EPR uh, Sharika. Um, so I mean, like HP, Samsung, LG, Motorola, whatever those companies, those are the brand owners. They are the ones who's responsible for EPR. It's extended producer responsibility. Producers here in is defined as the companies who are selling product in the market. So any all the brand owners are selling product in the market. Amitabh Sen, could you throw some light on returns to be filed as also about type of forms to be filled in? So the forms are listed in the, in the e-waste rules and it's basically forms are varied for obviously all users. I don't know um, which uh, user category you would be. So if you're a bulk consumer, for example, then you have to say how much e-waste that you generated uh, through, uh, through the year and uh, what category of electronic waste you generated. So there are codes which are um, you know, kind of showed in the schedule. Um, then how did you dispose it of? Um, where, which recycler, for, if you gave it to a recycler or if you gave it to a producer, um, you have to put in their details and have paperwork um, which indicates that they have, you've given it to them. So it's basically that kind of uh, return that you have to file. If you're a dismantler, basically you have to, uh, you have a lot more detail, um, you know, in terms of how much material you receive, which material did you receive, how much you recovered, what component you give where. So there are a lot of details. So each, for each, um, you, you know, you know, each uh, uh, stakeholder, the forms are different. Um, but these are basically, it's about how much you generated and how much you collected and how much you, you know, kind of, uh, whom did you give it? Uh, so these are basically uh, annual uh, numbers that you provide. Um, Panchan Bhattacharya, what are the financial assistance for startup and running entrepreneurs? Um, there was some sort of a scheme at some point for the recyclers where uh, the government was providing, I think, 25%, but I'm not too sure that kind of became very um, accessible at some point. So there are no financial assistance directly provided under this, but I think uh, um, they are, uh, you know, uh, since there is a lot of live, uh, you know, financial viability of these, uh, these um, plants, um, I think uh, these are attracting a lot of, uh, you know, financial, I would say, investment. Um, but uh, directly, no, there's no assistance being, assistance being provided um, for uh, dismantling or recycling. But um, I think uh, for a recycler, there is some bit of uh, a scheme at some point which Ministry of Environment and Forest was running, running which was around 25%. Uh, what is the process of PRO registration? Um, there is a PRO registration, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, this is a bit of tricky because initially in the regulation in 2016, there was no, you know, proper uh, registration for PRO assigned, but, um, you know, uh, subsequently there has been, uh, you know, uh, CPCB has come up with a registration form for PRO as well. So you have to give details about your operation, basically. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, which brands have you signed up? And you know, so that's the registration process uh, with the, uh, the Central Pollution Control Board. Mm, uh, how, how B2B e-commerce companies can participate, sorry, how B2B e-commerce company can participate in e-waste recycling? Um, so uh, if you are, I mean, you become a, you know, if you are uh, even, as I said, if you're an online or e-retailer, uh, even if you're selling from business to business, if 
you are um, uh, you know selling e waste or you are giving e waste um, putting it to a bulk consumer or i mean to businesses or uh, to individuals you you become part of you know you become producer so then all the rules which are there uh, become responsible uh, applicable to you so you you know will become a producer and one will become a bulk bulk consumer so once become a bulk consumer you will have to ensure that your waste is recycled given to a proper agency you know the, 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 i explained the form the the responsibilities and um, you know, the authorization that as a producer or as a bulk consumer you will have to do and b2b uh, e-commerce companies will fall under that um Dhabal Patel, please share more information about electronic item refurbisher. So if you're a refurbisher, it's again, refurbisher also has to seek authorization under the EVS regulation. And uh, yeah, after that, obviously, any uh, you have to file annual return. Uh, if you have to ensure that any waste which is generated under um, you know, your refurbishing process is sanitized to a proper dismantler or a recycler. Um, yeah, so I don't know what more information are you looking at. Uh, otherwise, it's a normal company that you can, uh, you, know, uh, you know, under Companies Act and under Factories Act, you have to uh, set up your company. But uh, this is additional uh, you know, permissions that you have to um, um, get from CPCB uh, authorization, uh, basically for e-waste uh, refurbishing. And then you have to the EVS rules become applicable and you have to follow all the, the norms which have been listed. Uh, can the quarterly annual return to be submitted to CPCB revised permitted? Um, there's only annual return. There's no quarterly return that you have to file. It's only annual return to be submitted to CPCB. Um, I think there, there is a you know time period which has been provided uh, where you can probably revise. I, though they've not been categorically mentioned, I think that you can um, revised it otherwise they also you know kind of um if they have a problem with your uh, annual return they obviously get back to you and then there's obviously an uh, explanation or you can uh, you know there's a time period which has been provided i think 60 days uh, by which you can um, you know kind of uh, reply to them a form where can we get a list of recycle from central pollution control board website um, is there any possibility that CPCB will add more products? Yes, as I said, that that's the 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 uh, first change that I am hoping will come very soon. Um, the schedule will be expanded. Um, how is target decided? I think I explained that. That's decided. For example, if you are selling a, a mobile phone, um, if you're a mobile phone company and you sold hundred mobile phones today. So mobile phone is um, supposed to have, I think, a lifespan. Smartphone has a lifespan of two years, according to CPCB guideline. I think so. It could be 18 months or two years. Um, so uh, two years later, so if I've sold it 2022, I've sold 100 phones. And um, you know, lifespan is two years. So to 2024, uh, I'm supposed to collect back 30% of that. That was the first year target. So that was in 2018. I think now we are standing at 40% target. So it's basically, unless it's been a bit, you know, kind of, um, I would say leverage given because of pandemic, but I think it's at 40% right now. So for example, if I sell 2000, today, if I sell 2000 to 100 phones, then in 2024, I have to collect 40 phones back. That's how the target is. For each equipment, the lifespan, is taken into account and the number of product that you've sold that is taken into account and the percentage of target is applicable that's how you calculate it um, or you can go through the guideline of uh, cpcb on e-waste and will be you know it will be ex explained in detail um, that was uh, Vishwajit Patil. Now we have uh, Mr. Elroy Johnson. Can you share more information on the market share Pan India level? Market share of what? It's not clear. Um, so if you, you want to expand that question, then I may be able to answer. 
Do you think the schedule is complete? Is there any near meetings of CPCB to enhance as does not? As I said, I think it's a question which is coming back again and again. Um, but yes, I think uh, the, the government regulatory agencies are already looking at expanding that list. Um, I think there's already some discussion happening on that account. How is target decided? It's again the same question. Does solar panel in EV battery come under e -waste? Solar panel does not come under uh, um, under e -waste currently. Um, electric vehicle battery also do not come under e -waste. No, that will come under the battery regulation once it comes in and solar, if it gets expanded. For example, solar panel, I think in certain countries it is part of e -waste, but in India currently it is not. How does SPCB, CPCB responsibility differ? So um, basically CPCB is the body which is looking at EPR authorizations. Um, so um, all the brands have to file uh, their uh, EPR authorization plan, EPR, um, they have to sort authorization, they have to, um, uh, uh, their ROSH compliance, everything they have to send it to CPCB. Um, that's at a national level, uh, whereas SPCB is uh, more um, into looking at uh, one, dismantling and recycling facilities within, um, within their states, which they are supposed to monitor. And also they, they are, um, uh, you know, uh, if the brands are functioning, they have an EPR plan and those brands are functioning in their state, whether those agencies are, you know, kind of clearly um, those collection centers are working or not. Um, so all those responsibility lie with SPCB. Um, CPCB is a more uh, a national level. So the EPR plan is a national level. Most brands, you know, kind of, I would say, function at a national level. So all that responsibility, setting up standards, setting, setting up technical guidelines for uh, recycling, dismantling, all that is CPCB's responsibilities. SPCB is mainly to check on ground whether things are actually getting implemented. And also, you know, giving permission um, to, to uh, dismantle the recycler, that's a local sub, uh, state subject. Any idea for solar panel module networking? It may get, it may get, because it, it is, um, you know, but I, I feel that it may not get in the first revision because uh, um, currently India still thinks that uh, there's not so much solar panel we started coming out. It will take some more time before the waste, um, you know, comes into, um, uh, into, uh, into the market. Um, and they might be a little delayed, but yes, I feel that it will um, sooner or later come in uh, under e waste regulations. Uh, it's not a guideline, it's a regulation. Uh, is it uh, compulsory now for a company brand owner to go to PRO? They can directly approach the recyclers, right? Um, you mean, uh, yes, yes, they can directly go to a recycler, they don't have to go to PRO is an optional scheme. If you want to use services of PRO, you can. If you don't want to, you can set up, set up your own collection center everywhere. Or you can tie up with a recycler to set up collection center for you. Um, it's up to you. It is, um, it's, I mean, you can have your own collection center all over. I mean, you can use your service centers. You can use your dealers to collect it back. You don't really have to have PRO. PRO is a service which is given because a lot of time it is cost effective because PRO is doing it for 10 brands. So if it's running a collection center, for example, if it's running a one small collection center in the heart of Delhi, then uh, 10 brands, if they sell it, everybody is paying for it. Whereas if there's a one center which is acting for a collection center for all 10 brands, then you save cost. So PR is basically meant that you um, kind of, um, you know, it's a shared uh, cost in some way. So it becomes a lot more feasible. Um, but again, it's an optional thing that, as I said. Um, is that any regulation for planned obsolescence, obsolescence. Um, uh, to reduce, I, 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 I hope you mean, or I am assuming that you mean that is there a regulation to address planned obsolescence? Um, no, unfortunately there is no, um, no plan. Um, um, again, this is something which, um, you know, I've just, I think a week back, we've come out with a report. You can look at our website, www.toxicsing.org. Uh, where we are, um, you know, come out with a paper where we are just, uh, clearly focusing that uh, um, e-waste uh, should not be dealt only at the management level of end of life, but we should be also looking at how do we reduce e-waste. And uh, obviously planned obsolescence is something which uh, is increasing the amount of e-waste. 
Um, so right now, not so much, but um, you know, recently, if you uh, also look at, I think, I don't know whether they put it out on their website, but they're working on this. This is the Ministry of IT uh, because they are working at the circular economy aspects of EV electronics as well. And there they are trying to look at uh, the planned obsolescence as well. So um, no, currently no regulation, but um, yeah, it will be some time before we have something like that. So what is the criteria to be PRO? Oh, no criteria. You should be a, whatever criteria is applicable to open a company. That's it. Can we get a financing financial working on battery and other EVs recycling business? Um, there would be consultants who will be providing these kind of financial workings. Uh, I think so. Yes, there are consultants. So Shagra, I think uh, yeah, you have to approach one of them. Uh, is CPCB expected to come up with any online facility for EPR filings coming? This I think there has been CPCB has been working, uh, Shubham, on um, you know uh, on on transferring a lot of this uh, you know system to online um, for even for bulk consumers because there was too much paperwork and that uh, you know did not really make sense. Um, so I've been hearing this for a couple of years now, but again, with pandemic, you know, everything got rewired. Um, But yes, I'm, uh, I, as far as I know, there was some attempt to um, have some, they were working with some agencies to develop some sort of an online uh, system. So yes, I think they are expected to come with some online facility. Is it not compulsory now? Shubham's question is answer, answer. Is it not compulsory now for a company brand owner to go to PRO? They can directly approach. Yes, I think I answered that. Yes, they can. They don't have to go to PRO. They can go direct. When an item is eligible for recycling or refurbishing, as we can see, even after end of life, it can be refurbished. So it keeps fine to keep refurbishing. Yes, it, you can keep on refurbishing. There's no, there's no mandated thing that you have to throw it or make it e-waste as such. If there is, a, I mean, if the life of a product can be extended, that's the best thing possible. So there is no mandate that, uh, you know, you have to throw it after five years. No, that's a basic idea. Okay? Your, your laptop is, or whatever, your mobile phone is, has an average life of two years. But if, if it can be uh, used and refurbished and sold again, why not? Um, that's more, uh, I would say, environment friendly option. Can you please tell me market leaders in e-waste collection? A collection is not a separate business as such. Um, um, and now a lot of brands are collecting. So I don't know, market leaders would be some of these brands which are collecting their e-waste. Um, otherwise, there would be some PROs who are collecting it, some recyclers. So it's kind of dispersed. Um, and there's no e-waste. There's no business as e-waste collection as such. Um, you know, it's... You know, I, I think some of the biggest brands uh, who sell, for example, I think uh, across, if you look at, um, you know, products, uh, somebody like LG or Samsung who are multi-product brands, uh, they will have the maximum targets and uh, they must be collecting the maximum amount or their vendors or their PROs must be collecting the highest amount, but they are doing it on behalf of Samsung or LG. So they would be market leaders in this collection, if you ask me. In that way. Yeah, next question is by Kanchan. Can we get your contact details, ma'am? Um, Chelsea, I suppose you can share my email uh, details with her and then I can check or, um, you know, I can just put in my email and you can get in touch with me and then you can see how. Oh, yeah, then is any producers has have produced not collect collection? What happens? Um, CB can CPCB can take uh, uh, action against it. As I said, there were some brands where their collection center was not working and they were uh, their imports were uh, stalled or their permissions to import was stopped. So, they the producers, if they don't meet target of the there has been some bit of leniency because it's a new regulation and the targets were new in 2018 and then in 2020 we got a pandemic. Their first full target was supposed to be finished by 2020 March actually because 2018 I think it became applicable from October so that was a six month period. The full year came in from 2019 April to 2020 March I think so. 
um, and uh, and that time pandemic hit. Um, so so I think there have been a bit of leniency post that, but uh, yes, but they they can be under the regulation. They could be penalized under EPA Act. Um, so you know there could be fines. They, you you clearly says that if you are not fulfilling your EPA responsibility, you are not allowed to put products in the market. So so so. So uh, the regulatory agencies can actually take that action, stop your sales in the, the country, uh, penalize you, you can find, go to the jail. That's also you know, a provision. Nobody has been put into that. Only, as I said, that uh, there has been some bit of uh, import uh, um, restricted, or your sales restricted in the country. That has happened uh, to some of the brands for a short period. Um, but this... This option is there. Uh, the regulatory agencies can, if you continue to not fulfill your target or not do anything to fulfill your target, um, then these actions could be. RPRO compulsory no. Uh, RPRO compulsory can direct sell to recycle? No. They are collecting it on behalf of producers. So they can, even if they're selling it directly, they can sell it only when the brands give them that permission. So if brand says, you manage my whole downstream, you don't have to give it back the material to me. You can sell it. I will pay you this much, for example. So that's the economics between them. He can directly sell it to recycle. Yes, he can. Like water harvesting government policies, like uh, water harvesting government policies on e-waste collection center in housing societies. They could be, you know, some of the PROs are working with uh, with housing societies to collect the waste, if that's what you mean. Kanchan, maybe get PDF files for recycling assignments. I'm not clear what you mean. Is there any regulation for SEZ to discard IT uh, and not allowed to be? There, there are certain restrictions on SEZ. You can't give it back. You have to ensure that it um, kind of travels out and not, um, you know, kind of put back into the country without any permission. Yes, they are. Can you share your Twitter? I don't have a Twitter account. Okay, I think um, we are quite uh, you know, delayed as well. Um, I think I've answered all the questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Actually, we have gone like half an hour more. Yeah, that's quite a, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. And it was an interesting session. Thank you so much. Like always, you, you have been a support for us in all our initiatives. And uh, as I have informed in the previous welcome note, uh, if anyone has any doubts regarding our upcoming events, you can uh, keep us posted. I have shared uh, I have shared our company uh, details here in the chat box. So if anyone has any questions regarding it, uh, you can keep us updated. And uh, regarding the participation, uh, we have given uh, uh, the contact details. You can reach out to us. And we are also coming up with a series of webinars in the upcoming week. Uh, our next webinar will be on uh, budget 2022, focused on uh, recycling and reverse logistics and circular economy. So if you are being, uh, if you are interested in the topics, whichever uh, we do, please follow us on LinkedIn and uh, also on our Telegram group. So you'll get more updates regarding it. And uh, please do uh, share your feedback regarding the webinar. That will be really helpful for us to work further more uh, and uh, give more quality deliverables. So once again, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your time in your busy schedule. Uh, and also, uh, thank you one and all. If you have any, doubt, any doubts, you can just reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.